Hello, my History 461 students. This is Professor Donald Earl Collins. It is now week five. And this week we turn to the Great Depression, World War II period of African American and ironically U.S. history, and how, not so ironically, and how the two dovetail with each other completely and utterly in this particular case. Um, there are lots of themes to talk about. Every week we are breaking off a chunk of history down a full 15, 16 week schedule as a minimum of two weeks, sometimes three, depending on what you're talking about. And this section is no, um, is, is not an exception in this particular case. There's a, there's a lot here. Um, and if I were to go straight through, it would be a two hour lecture minimum, maybe three hours, but I, you know, I have other stuff to do, and so do you, so you don't need me to take up that much time. Um, but before I get to all that, I just want to say a few things. First of all, great, great work on um, your um, post and, and, and responses this week for week four. It's great work. So I don't really have a lot to complain about. Or, uh, but I do have a couple of things I want people to be um, more cautious about, to be perfectly honest. You know, slavery is important. There's no doubt in my mind that a significant part of what we consider the African American experience is not just slavery, but the legacy of what we've had to live with in terms of systemic racism in the United States as a result of having a system of slavery for a quarter of a millennia. Right, 246 years, that's a quarter, you know, 250 years, that's a quarter of a millennium. That's a long time to actually have something in, in place, and yet we're only about 155, 157 years removed from the end of chattel slavery. And even with that, there are, you know, as with the exception of the 13th Amendment, of course, is for people who are incarcerated, who are in prison, who are basically forced to work for free or very little under ruling conditions, you know, very, very similar to chattel slavery, even though it's, you know, not really generational in a pure sense, but it can be through the mechanisms of mass criminalization, incarceration, but that's a different story. My main point is, is that it's important, but to call people who are not enslaved slaves is to demean their status, too. So, if you're dealing with black migrants, most black migrants are under the age of 30, Right, coming up north to New York and Pittsburgh and Chicago and St. Louis and Kansas City and so on and so forth. So call them black, call them African American because that's who they are. Don't call them slaves or ex slaves or the descendants of slaves. Yes, we're all, technically speaking, every African American, Afro Caribbean, and maybe even some. African black people who live in the United States are essentially the descendants of slaves because of long-term trade of slavery over a millennia. But that doesn't mean that just because those people might be slaves, that's the one thing you emphasize. Um, you know, if you wrote my obituary and you emphasize the fact this descendant of sharecroppers, blah, blah, blah. Well, gee, I think I think about myself, I don't think about myself in those terms. I know who I am. I don't need you to remind me of it. And that would be the same for these descendants of slaves. You'll need to remind them of who they are. There's a reason why they're leaving the South. It's partly because they're being reminded every day of their so-called inferiority. So don't do that. That's one thing. The other thing is, for some of you, stop apologizing for the fact, or, or stop apologizing, mythologizing, um, and um, quite frankly, trying to... Uh -huh you know, trying to put a spin on things that kind of slants how we look at African Americans as they're living through the history that they're going through, whether it be the Harlem Renaissance, um, you know, the Great Migration, you know, finding work, finding places to live, etc., etc. Oh, they found a place to live, but all the houses were beat up. That's true in a lot of cases, but it's not true in every case. Oh, they found places to live that people don't want them there. Do you think African Americans really walked around every single day thinking about the racism that you know they might have to deal with? I'm pretty sure it might have come up as part of a conversation. But it's not literally central to every aspect of African American life, right? It's a theme. It's a big theme, but it's not the only thing going on because people are people. 
right? You get caught up in things like taking care of your kids or dealing with relationships or trying to improve yourself, right? Or trying to work in order to make money. Those, you know, you know, everyday concerns that most people have, you know, living in a capitalist society. So don't just treat African Americans as if they're just victims of racism every day. Yes, that's part of the story too, but it's not the whole story. Nor do you treat them as overcomers who with great resilience rise and strive and make it to, you know, whatever they make it to, whether it's out of poverty or getting a higher edu you know, higher education or moving into the middle class or, you know, being the first black person to do X, Y, Z, Z times 10 to the 24th, whatever else you want to talk about, right? The truth of the matter is black people are just people. Just happen to be black. Just happen to be of African heritage, right? They have to have this legacy. So I don't need you apologizing because this happened to black folk. I don't need you um, make, turning you know, black folk into myth in terms of like being super resilient and super strong and all this other, nor do you need to treat them as just mere victims of racism all the time. Because all those things are somewhat true, but they are not the, the, the they're not the sum and the sum of all the parts is greater than the parts that you're talking about. So I need you to think more holistically about the people you're talking about. They're going through good, bad, and ugly, just like any other group of people go through in, in, in history any other group. There's a rather unique history for African black folk living in the United States, right? For, you know, American black folk living in the United States. But it's not, you know, so unique that it, it's beyond the pale of the normal human condition of oppression and discrimination and things of that nature, because there are plenty of other groups we could be talking about in that regard, too. Native Americans would come to mind, just as a for instance, right? So, cool it on that, please. Thank you. That's the only thing I really wanted to bring up because it's a theme that's run through some of the threads and posts I've seen this semester. And it's one thing to talk about that in the midst of slavery, but these people are doing way more than just surviving the aftermath of slavery because U.S. history is not slavery. The aftermath of slavery, I mean, it's not that simple. Okay. So anyway, this week, we're concentrating on African Americans during the Great Depression and World War II. And there is a lot happening, but the main theme is, there, there are about three main themes, right? The main theme with it all is how these black migrants who move up north in the Midwest, as they as slowly, the black, some of the black population shifts out of the rural south into the rural, into, into the urban south, into urban areas throughout the North and Midwest. And then the Depression comes along, which hits southern rural economy first, which actually accelerates black migration up north and the Midwest, and eventually out west to the far west of California and Oregon and Washington State and so on. Um, <clears throat> but it eventually start, it hits, hits the rest of the country. I could, you, know, you could literally spend an entire class just talking about the causes of the Great Depression just by itself, right? And that's just too much to cover, so I can't cover it reasonably in a short video. Let's just say for the sake of argument that because the economies of the world were not open to free trade at this point, and because one of the bigger economies in the world, the German economy, was dependent on northern, on, excuse me, on U.S. capital in order to pay reparations to the French and to the British, the result of U.S. economy going through a recession actually pushed recession in Germany, and that and the German collapse of their economy pushed the collapse of the economies in the U in the U.K. and France, and they couldn't recover because they weren't trading with each other, right? If there's no trade going on, your natural economy's in recession, then there's no you know there's you don't have anything to make this work. And these economies are not consumer-based economies at this point. I mean, there are there there's some semblance of a consumer-based economy going on in the UK and, and and in the United States, but it's not there, right? It's not there yet because only 15% of the population is middle class, and another 10% is super rich, and the other 75% is between working class, working poor, and dirt poor. Right, that's seventy-five percent of the U.S. population is somewhere between working class and poor. 
this idea of half of the people in the country having middle class status, that's a post-World War II event. That's not happening during, um, certainly in the years before the Great Depression. Don't get me wrong, there's middle class folks living around in the U.S. and so on and so forth. And there's this image of the Warring Twenties being this period where lots of people made it into the middle class. There weren't lots of people. Everybody was buying everything on credit. Food, oil, paying rent on credit, you know, paying rent over time. Everything was on credit. And when you have a credit-based economy and a consumer-based economy and it falls apart, and you got to pay folks back, you have run on banks, you have run on everything. And so that's how you get to the point where a country where there's overproducing food has 5 billion people starving in it by 1933. Mind you, the U.S. population at this time is about 135 million people. So you're dealing with a ridiculous situation where, you know, everything's falling apart. You've got widespread homelessness, you've got malnourishment, you've got starvation, you've got murder suicides where fathers are killing up their families and kill, killing themselves, alcoholism's up, crime rates way up with John Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde and other folks robbing banks, right? Organized crime is, have, has moved in because of prohibition and it's here to stay in the 1930s, you know, even with the depression. So there's Tons of stuff going on. But for African Americans, the situation is things are bad everywhere. In the rural South, it's bad because, you know, you've got overproduction and no one wants to buy anything because no one has any money to buy anything. So you're selling cotton at like a, p a penny, a, a bushel type thing, a penny. You know, that's, you know, bale, penny a bale. You know, wheat for pennies on dollar what it used to be worth. I mean, as sharecroppers, you're just going to be in debt, and you might not even have enough money for food. So that's why people left. In the urban north, in you know, factory jobs with um, jobs as laborers and domestic workers, you might have been hired when you were 28 and doing pretty well, but by 1931-32, you're losing your job. You're, you're the last hired, first fired oftentimes because of your status, because of your race. So unemployment rates for blacks um, in, in cities across the country is about a ratio of two to one to whites. So white unemployment rate is, say, 15%, or it's 30% for blacks. If it's 30% for whites, it's 60% for blacks, right? That kind of thing. In places like Detroit and Pittsburgh and New York, you're looking at unemployment rates between 45 and 60% at, at the height of the Great Depression. And keep in mind, we're only talking guys for the most part. Women are not usually counted as part of the employment statistics unless it's domestic worker, as a domestic worker. If it's that, then you might have an unemployment rate of about 45-50%. But generally speaking, um, we're talking about mostly counting boys and men between the ages of 10 up to about 60. That's how they used to do the unemployment rate because there was no unemployment insurance at the federal level until the Social Security Act in 1935 was passed, right? And so, so job discrimination meant they were the first, f first fired or first terminated from their positions during the Depression. So everything that's hitting white Americans is happening twice as bad to blacks, right? Can't find work, can't be, take care of your family, you know, that kind of thing. And so... <clears throat> you know, family abandonment becomes big in that in this period, just as it was for whites. Do not try to stereotype and say, oh, so that's where black father issues come from. Absolutely not. That, you know, talk about racial stereotypes. Don't don't get that in your head. Um, but it, it's happening a lot, right? Because people don't have money to take care of their families. So there's that. <clears throat> But you recognize the fact that there's an added dimension to this, and some black activists recognize this at the height of the Depression. And so what they do, um, are, there, there are two campaigns that are going on in the 1930s around economic equality and equity and um, activism in this period. One is what's known as the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign. Um, and this is specific to... Um, black, predominantly black neighborhoods like Harlem, like um, U Street Shaw in Washington, D.C., like parts of South Side Chicago, like Bronzeville, for example, um, or what becomes later is Cabrini Green in Chicago, parts of South Side Chicago. Um, 
the Lower Hill District, what used to be the Lower Hill District in Pittsburgh, where you would have a lot of white-owned grocery stores, mom-and-pop shops, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, selling their goods even at the height of the Depression, and everybody who worked in that store was white, white or Jewish, you know, which, you know, at this period is not quite white. I mean, you know, we've already talked about this in this course, so... And so the result is they would picket, they would boycott, they would organize people so they wouldn't shop at these stores anymore until they started hiring um, black boys and black men to be shopkeepers and stockers and things, uh, stock boys um, and all that, cashiers and so on. And those campaigns did work to get some people hired, but as you can imagine, there are only so many A&Ps in Washington, D.C., or in New York, or shop rights, or whatnot, that who can hire so many people, right, at the local level. But it was one way to combat the widespread unemployment in these communities um, throughout the United States. Another big method in terms of that was to unionize, right? And there were local attempts and more national attempts to unionize black workers, the most famous of which was led by A. Philip Randolph um, and his Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. He started this union in 1917 to organize black um, porters who worked, you know, who carried por portage or baggage, you know, put them on trains, took them off trains, et cetera, et cetera, but they were being paid about half of what white workers were being paid. He organized this union and eventually got Pullman to up to pay for black porters to the point where it was a lucrative job. We were making almost as much, if not as much in many cases, as the white porters who worked on these trains, right? And so made it a more meaningful job. And, th and his campaign to organize people locally and nationally continued well into the 1930s. So, so you have all that going on. In addition to that, you have the rise of the strategy that would lead to the end of Jim Crow segregation in the United States in the 1930s. Comes out of Howard University's law school led by Charles Houston Jr. Sr. Um, I actually knew his son for a number of years because I went to graduate school with him. Um, <laughs> that's how old I am. Um, and anyway, but his strategy, which was taken up by lawyers like Thurgood Marshall and uh, William Hasty and other prominent black lawyers from Baltimore to D.C. corridor, who had gone to law school and studied under Houston, it was a strategy of basically taking apart separate but the separate but equal clause within Plessy versus Ferguson, which allowed Jim Crow segregation to be legal in the first place. Um, and so that strategy starts taking hold by them going to court over simple cases which show that, hey, we're supposed to have equal funding for these schools and, you know, at universities, you know, we're supposed to have separate schools for blacks in Maryland, and yet there are no historically black colleges or universities in the state of Maryland. We need one. And so the court would rule in favor of them and say, hey, state of Maryland spent some money to create a black school, black, an all-black law school. Either that or let the guy who applied to University of Maryland Law School into the law school. And that's ultimately what they did. They ended up letting, instead of creating an entire new law school, they create, you know, they just said, okay, you've got the qualifications, you go to law school. It was the first of a whole series of cases that over a 20 year period leads to the Brown decision in 1954. And why am I telling you all this now? It's because of the fact that. You all tend to have this fantasy that the civil rights movement just rose up in 1954-55 because of the Brown decision in Rosa Parks, when all of that has a history that goes back generations. In this case, at least a full generation. So that's why I'm mentioning that. That kind of work, that kind of activism and agitation continues into World War II. You know, A. Philip Randolph... You know, you know, trying to force the federal government to create a, um, to create laws that deal with the exclusion of blacks from defense contract work um, in Detroit and other parts of the country. Threatens a march in Washington with a march in Washington movement of 10,000 black men coming to D.C. to march. Um, that leads um, indirectly to FDR cre um, creating Executive Order 8802, which basically, and, and with it, a a federal employment practices commission that actually oversees to make sure that there isn't pure exclusion of blacks from working in defense 
in defense-related industries throughout the war. It was hit and miss, didn't always work, but it was there. The creation of CORE in 1942, the Congress uh, of Racial Equality to deal with issues of discrimination and to organize more people. There was a lot of organizing during the war. It's part of the larger theme of what's known as the Double V Campaign. What is the Double V Campaign? The Double V Campaign is victory at home and in the war. You know, this war wasn't just about, hey, let's go have fight in Europe and fight Japan because it'll be lots of fun. We were fighting fascist countries, right? Countries that, you know, that were fascist and racist and had race, racist policies towards the people they conquered, who were willing to slaughter entire groups in order to, to, to proclaim their superiority over those groups. Whether you're talking about Germans and Jews and, and Slavs, Eastern Europeans, or are you talking about the Japanese? Yes, the Japanese used to have a racial philosophy where they saw Chinese folks, the folks that gave them the characters to help create their freaking language, right? A thousand years ago, is inferior to them. And so they tried to conquer them and slaughter as many of them as they could. The rape of Nanking, or Nanjing, is what it's really known as, is an example of that. Um, and so... If we're going to fight fascism and racism abroad, that's what you know. Black activists are saying. Then why? Are, why we definitely should be fighting it at home. And so there are all kinds of campaigns that went on during the war, including you know this legal battle to end you know Jim Crow segregation. You know the integration of lunch counters in Washington D.C. is one example um, of that. More better hiring practices is another example of that. Things. You know, people literally threatening to go on strike in the middle of the war is another example of that. And so this period is a period of great agitation. And it wouldn't, none of this would have been possible were it not for the radicalizing effect of the Great Depression and the fact that there's still, by the time you get to the 1930s, there are several million black folk living in the urban North and Midwest. You've got another several hundred thousand starting to move out west to California and other places. Jackie Robinson's and his family uh, moves out um, to Pasadena in the 1930s. That's how we hear of Jackie Robinson in the first place, right? So all of that is sort of the groundswell for what does become the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. But you have to have something to start from, and it doesn't just automatically start one day. That's a process. And so... There's a lot to this week that I haven't even covered. I haven't covered um, black men in the military. I haven't covered the New Deal, what it did and didn't do for African Americans. There's so many other things that I can't possibly cover without this being a 45-minute video. So we're going to stop here.